Hello and welcome to No Rest for the Weekend, where we go behind the scenes and talk to the creators of independent entertainment. I'm Jason Godby, and with me in the Rabbit Hole studio today, he is the director of documentary programs at the Tribeca Film Institute. Very happy to have him, Mr. Jose Rodriguez. Welcome, Jose. Thanks, Jason. Hey, man, thanks for coming. No, that's appreciate really it. You schlepped all the way from Tribeca? Actually, from from like a couple of blocks away. I live in Park Slow. So. Oh, nice, man. Yeah. Nice. Uh, we always love to have Brooklyn people on the show. Yeah. Uh, so I got to ask you, uh, there's a number of, number of questions when it comes to Tribeca Film Institute mm -hmm. versus Tribeca Film Festival. Correct. Uh, so I want to kind of make that distinction and figure out what right. it is you do and how you help filmmakers. But first, yep. let's talk about you and yep. kind of your background and how you got into this whole thing. So how did you come, get into filmmaking and, and what is your origin story, so mm. to speak? So I was born and raised in Puerto Rico. Um, and I knew from the very beginning that I wanted to make films. Um, I knew that I wanted to kind of shadow a producer in, in a career. Um, and I, I kind of had a very um, basic awareness of, of the Hollywood industry, um, you know, shadowing producer, reading scripts. Uh, and I was so... At 18, I left Puerto Rico, went to Syracuse, uh, did undergrad there, and then moved here in 08, in 2008, and then started interning at different production companies. Back then, there used to be a lot of production companies, um, and I did script coverage and book coverage and um, would assist producers. Um, and it, it that was obviously a very intense year, the Wall Street collapse. Uh, and I it took me like two years, a year and a half to get uh, a full-time job. And so in the meantime, I was uh, well reading scripts on one hand, and then I worked at the Paley Center for Media as a as an usher, which was really great and getting to you know be in, surrounded by so many like these, these television archives. Um, I also worked for Nielsen Ratings as a survey question writer. So they, I would go in, it's like a night shift, I would go in and write questions about TV shows and it was just like data being compiled for advertisers to determine our, our viewers understanding the show. Um, and so I did those three jobs, kind of clockwork for a year and a half, two years. And then I was fortunate enough to uh, land this job at Tribeca. So I've been at Tribeca Film Institute eight years, going on nine. Wow. So you got a really well-rounded sort of look at the industry yeah. as you were coming up. That's really cool. So, okay, so for people who don't know, what is the Tribeca Film Institute? Mm -hmm. As opposed, because I think a lot of people know the film festival. Yes. Uh, that's very popular. Very popular. And, uh, and if you're a filmmaker, if you're watching this show, you know what the Tribeca Film Festival is. But the Tribeca Film Institute, yeah. kind of explain that, what yeah. that is and, and what your mission is over mm -hmm. there. The Tribeca Film Festival was created, many people might know, after 9 11. You know, like the entire Tribeca neighborhood was pretty decimated and, and bare and barren. Um, um, no business, businesses were not thriving and people didn't want to go back to the neighborhood and kind of resume life. So um, Robert De Niro and Jane Rosenthal and Craig Hatkoff decided to bring the community back into that neighborhood. And, you know, I remember that first year, I wasn't there, obviously, but um, it was like Nelson Mandela, Meryl Streep, Hugh Grant, Scorsese. Uh, they all rallied together to um, launch the first edition. And then as the festival was being created and launched, um, they also wanted to create an institute um, to support filmmakers and that back then it was to support New York filmmakers, both uh, fiction and scripted uh, storytellers and documentary filmmakers. Um, and then every year that passed, uh, brick by brick, more programs were created, um, more funds, more opportunities for filmmakers, and the scope and the reach um, expanded. So I'm, I'm the director of documentary programs, uh, and that means that I oversee uh, all the programs that we have at the Institute to support documentary. Uh, documentary films, both feature documentaries and documentary shorts. Um, and the way I like to kind of talk and pitch TFI and my our department is that we really try to cater to as many type of filmmakers as possible. So we we have grants available for filmmakers that live and work in Latin America, you know, Mexico, Central America, South America, the Caribbean. Um, we, we have um, a program called Tribeca All Access, which uh, has now been internationalized a little bit and we expanded a, a little bit more the program, but it, it tends to 
the majority of the filmmakers we support are U.S. based filmmakers that live and work in the United States. So it's our domestic program, um, kind of really supporting those emerging voices. And and then we have other programs. One of them is uh, an international documentary fund for social issue driven films. So uh, stories that have some urgency to them. Uh, you know, maybe it's a topic that isn't addressed in the media, and the film can be a vehicle to shed light into that topic. Or it's an, or the film can be an artful way to talk about something that we're seeing in the media. Um, and then we have um, uh, programs for documentary shorts, and we have a fiction program uh, for scripted storytellers talking about math, science, and tech in their story. Um, no sci-fi, just has to be grounded in scientific and mathematic and technological um, story elements. Um, and so if you have that kind of story, like you just go on our website, see what's available, what stage you're at, how much footage you have in the case of documentaries, in the case of a scripted storyteller, uh, a treatment or, or several, you know, a draft of their first draft of the script or even a rough cut maybe. Um, so you can just go in and see where you're at, what kind of footage you have available, and do you, is, does the program fulfill the mission of the filmmaker and vice versa. When a film comes to you, so people kind of apply, mm -hmm. and, I, yeah. and, and I'm and I'm assuming not everybody gets greenlit through, like, no, yeah. so uh, you're looking for, are you looking for particular types of qualities in a film, or is like, is there a certain stage of development that's ideal mm. to come to you at? Like, w explain that a little bit in terms of like, what gets in and what, what is more likely not to get in. Right. You know, it's very competitive, like, like most funds and programs. Um, we have this Tribeca Lex program I mentioned is the, the most kind of accessible. Um, we, we get about 200 submissions or so, and maybe we, we pick between five and seven. And so 200 submissions for scripted and doc. So right now I'm in the stage, the period in my, my job, this is the, the phase in, in, at TFI where we're reviewing submissions. Um, submissions were closed last year and I'm going application by application, reading, um, well, first and foremost, the no, number one thing that elevates it is, is the story compelling? Um, is the, in, in terms of documentary film, does the access that the filmmaker has, is it compelling, is it, is it you know unique? Has, have we heard or seen the story before? Um, and then that that if the answer is yes, 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 yes is good, yes, great access, uh, yes it's compelling. We haven't seen it. Um, then it, you're in a, a league of your own, and the, whether you're in development or pro production or post, that really doesn't matter. Like first and foremost, it's a good story, and then we look at the nitpick, the, the granular things. Um, you know, can we, if you're in early stage, um, maybe it's, it's we don't want to put a $10,000 grant towards it just yet. Maybe we can track it for next year when you're be, when the filmmaker will be in stronger footing. Um, on the other hand, you can make an argument early in development, we can show off, we can put an, a 10K grant down, um, support the filmmaker at an early stage to give them that push to get to industry exposure and get more funding. Um, and so if you're in post-production, do you, you obviously everybody needs money, but is our contribution when you're like almost closing your budget, is that really gonna, is it a drop in the bucket when you already have other funders and other supporters? Um, or is it a such an amazing story that it, it merits TFI to get behind that story? Um, so there's a lot of variables, um, and yeah, and only a handful get the grant, but, but we do kind of look through everything and it's kind of cliche to say but what we look for really is just compelling story acts unique perspective and something that we haven't seen before so somebody if they come to you they've got they got to have all their ducks in a row yeah they got to do their homework mm -hmm. and when you you know with a you're you're not the people to go to to get them access to their subject matter you, you want somebody who's already come in they say hey i've got this person i've right. got that person kind right. of thing yeah um, and you mentioned ten thousand. Is that a typical grant, or is that like just a starter grant? Or? That's the so we're we're pretty scrappy uh, as an institute. Uh, we're we, I kind of we kind of call ourselves we're very boutique oriented in how we support filmmakers. So ten um, k is the minimum uh, grant amount you would get. 
Um, and then this international social issue-driven fund that um, I mentioned, the the biggest, the cap is $25,000. So, okay. so, so, so it can yeah. be like, it's kind of strategic. Right. The way we see it is 10K or whether it's 10K and it, or And it could come at any stage. So it's like, if, I, if I'm if i like, I've got all my ducks in a row and this, this is the, the 10K that's going to kick me off. Right. Or, you know, get me through production right. or, you know, maybe it's completion money at right. the end when I'm trying to pay my editor and all that kind of stuff. Right. Uh, now, here's a tricky one. Hmm. So TFI is a nonprofit organization. Yes. So if my documentary is for profit mm -hmm. and I'm getting grant, but how does that, is that, um, is that, do I have to be a nonprofit entity myself? No. no. Yeah, a filmmaker, an individual can apply for the grant, um, it's it's kind of a, a gift. Like we don't, we're not expecting any rights in return. Um, we do outline a set of deliverables. Um, so if you get the grant, let's say you get a twenty-five thousand dollar grant, um, the first amount is given to you as you sign the agreement, um, and then the rest is released depending on the deliverables. In which, like a rough cut or rough assembly, we take a look, we give you notes, and then we release the remaining amount. Um, now, do I have to take your notes? No. Okay, so these are more we suggestions. Strongly encouraged. Strongly but. encouraged. So, so like if I'm if I'm producing a, a doc with a TFI grant, I don't I don't necessarily it's it's not owned by TFI. No. You know, I mean, if I'm smart, um, and I'm sure there's somewhere I'm putting your name on the film somewhere. So what we ask, so in terms of well, so notes is more. It's always kind of the the situation where this is our impression of your cut as of now. And they, you know, the, I, I would say a majority of the time the filmmaker is already arriving at those conclusions uh, structurally, th like in terms of the, cr the, the edit itself. Um, in terms of like representation, our grants are, you know, somewhat small. So we, we know kind of we have to we have to gauge what we ask. So what we, the minimum is we want our logo in the end credits and then and then an acknowledgement that says supported by and then the program that that got the grant that delivered the grant right i mean and as far as those like deliverables because i think the hardest thing with documentaries like documentaries are a marathon not a sprint yep. most of the time yes. so if i'm doing a documentary do you have a specific time schedule when i need to get you the rough cut and say and all that kind of stuff or is it just when i do that it's when you do it usually um what we usually do is like our filmmakers are very um thorough and and responsible and checking in with us on a fairly frequent basis. Our agreement says that you should check in with us at least every five to six months, six to eight, depending on where you're at uh, with it. Usually the U.S.-based filmmakers tend to be more uh, kind of checking in more often as opposed to our international filmmakers, but if we haven't heard from a given project in a while, we use the the kind of we, it kind of acts like a blueprint their application there's a question in our application where you would delineate the timeline that you're implementing to finish the film and so we go back to that and kind of see okay uh, so and so said that by January 2019 they would have a rough cut and so we just casually email them and say do you are you ready but usually if there's money uh part of the grant attached they check in with us quickly and they're like here's the rough cut we look forward to your notes um can, can we you release the remaining amount yeah i i think that's probably the smart way to do it um i mean uh, i'm not sure and i probably don't want to get into this but like i'm sure there's probably been cases of things that haven't been finished um or yeah. take a long time to be you know because mm -hmm. like uh documentaries like dog years yeah. <laughs> for some people yeah. uh and it takes a long time uh i've I've done some documentary work, mostly in, in short documentary, mm. and uh, I've also been an editor for certain documentary projects. And it's always one of those things where uh, the person who's got their act together from the beginning and really has things planned and written and knows what the end result is going to be, mm. uh, it's always much easier to, mm. to work on those projects just right. because... You know, uh, the docs can if you're not if you don't play your cards right, they can be really sort of amorphous. Yeah. And uh, and have to really kind of rely on an editor to to put them together. Right. Uh, and uh, you know, I've had somebody I had somebody ask me recently about, hey, can you come take a look at my film? And I'm like, 
well, you know, uh, you know, how many hours of film do you have? We got about 20 hours of film. Yeah, like, you know? well, <laughs> okay. Um, in, the next, in, the, in four cuts from now, I'll take Yeah, exactly, because yeah. it's just it's so much work. Yeah. Um, now, in, in that regard, in terms of the advice you're giving people, um, do you ever kind of help people with their development and say, you know, like, we list, listen, we think we have a good idea here, um, and but let we let's give you an advisor who's going to help mm. you kind of develop. Do you work that hands on, or is it mainly? Well, so what we tend to do is, I mean, if you get a grant from us, um, we're kind of a concierge approach to supporting you. So anything from you know the grant is given and you spend they spend it. Everything from um, connecting you to a possible consultant editor or consulting producer, or um, if you, when you're when the filmmaker's like looking at festivals, like strategizing with the filmmaker, um, all bets, all everything is on the table. Um, be, again, because we're a small team and our grants can only go so far, but but our mentorship and, and orientation in the industry can can be like f for the rest of the filmmaker's career. That's really cool. Uh, you know, so they have the option. They're, they're not, they're not handcuffed to you, but right. you know, like say, hey, you know, we got smart people right. who know how to do this stuff. I right. Mean, you kind of be foolish not to take it right. advantage of that. Right. I mean, I certainly would. Right. Uh, but so let me ask you. So in terms of that, and we got a lot to talk about yeah. in in a little time. Mm -hmm. So um, have there? Can you give us an example of like have there been any like uh, success stories that you found that um, like give me like a, an example of, of a film that came through you guys and, w and and was successful well it's a long list but I'll say this of the five uh, best documentary feature nominees two of them are supported by us so those are great success stories they're amazing um, one of them is called Mining the Gap and it's an absolutely stunning um, character driven documentary about uh, friendship between three young men in Chica in Chicago in uh, Illinois, um, and it w premiered at Sundance last year, uh, and now it's available on Hulu. So I definitely recommend people to watch it. It's stunning, and the other one is called Hill County This Morning This Evening, and um, it's it's an um, unbelievably gorgeous, stunning um, kind of essayistic film about um, the contemporary African American experience in this country, and uh, that's. Uh, playing at Metrograph right now, so you should see it on the biggest screen yeah. possible. I mean, by the time the series probably won't, it won't be. It uh, might be you actually. Know, it might well, be because of the Oscars, but yeah. If not, it'll probably be uh, on on some platform soon. But uh, those are stunning films that we are honored to support. Fabulous! That's amazing. Yeah. Uh, that's um, and and I'm sure that uh, you know, and what do you remember like? what sort of the typical timeline they worked on? Did one mm. take years and one took months kind of thing? Well, Mind the Gap um, is is a, a TFI alum uh, because we gave, we invited the filmmaker to come to our uh, film market during the festival in 2015, I believe. And I remember that movie did take a long time. Um, it's And you see it on, on on the screen. It's just like so so organic and so thoughtfully made that um, it's the filmmaker really needed to craft three different stories, himself included, because he's in the film, and a uh, story about families and what it means to be a man in con contemporary America, mm. these weighty issues told very creatively and artistically. Um, and I would say the same thing for Hale County. Uh, it's, not, it's not a traditional... Uh, Documentary that many people would have seen. It's t it's told again in a kind of more abstract way, but but equally potent. Um, and it's that's not easy to to just like it's yeah. not it's not just following my character and and maybe pinpointing a specific arc. Mm -hmm. um, it it goes beyond that. Um, it's great though that I mean uh, to have I mean two out of the five nominees. <laughs> that's amazing. And obviously you know, you know it's um, the people we were just you know. Part of what we do is that we support. We're again, we're very yeah, we're very strategic in how we support a project. But then right behind us, or right in front of us, or around us, there's like 20, 30 more amazing documentary leaders and partners that support it. Hale County and Mind the Gap. Um, so it's it's you know 
on, on, on our end, it's a little bit of like one contribution and everybody else is kind of contributing to it. And it's it a team it effort. Different. Like it, it's it takes a, a village. Effort. Yeah, right. It takes a village yeah. to raise a documentary. Yeah. <laughs> um, so um, what I want, one of the things I wanted to do too, since you you deal with this stuff, you've been doing this a long time. Mm-hmm. What advice do you have for uh, documentary filmmakers? Like, mm-hmm. give me look right here and, and uh, t- talk right Perfect. to them as if the, as if they were here. What mm-hmm. what advice could you give a doc maker? Um, I mean, I would say to for those that are obviously in New York, I mean anywhere, but it, pinpoint and target organizations and communities and clubs, uh, collaboratives, collectives, you name it, that are developing documentary film that are generating discourse and creating conversations around documentary film whether that's like a a documentary film club or um, a a space where they do panel discussions or they workshop projects be nosy that way and get get your your head into those uh, spots and network Um, places like that like Union Docs in Williamsburg is amazing like, you know, Brick, uh, DCTV. Um, New York has such a great asset for, for creative people that you really can um, find those spots to really, you know, get your name out there, get your project out there, and hopefully end up being in a space where you can pitch and then move and network um, and, and actually really, really look at funding resources. Once you're creating a communal um, atmosphere in your neighborhood, in your in your borough, uh, in your town, look at funds in the U.S. that actually they're competitive, yes, and you know they're they're as intense as they are, but they're but they're there, and you 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 at least try. You should you know if you don't try. It's not going to happen. So I would say just be curious, be nosy, um, and hustle. Yeah, I, I also think that there's there's some merit in the pitching process mm-hmm. as well, because I mean I don't know if this ever happens with you guys, but do you ever people ever pitch you and you say you know what this looks good, but work on it a little bit more and then come back to us. You know, do you, do you have that kind of feedback with people? Yeah, I mean for us, the, you know, the, the pitch ends up being what we end up ha- receiving for the most part are like via email, just like a verbal pitch or like a a written pitch and then like the sample and so we usually are liaisoning or communicating with these filmmakers via email and we for the most part we do tend to say like i can't see your your story and your sample as of now um but aim for not don't don't apply for this cycle apply for the next cycle Mm -hmm. um and then and in between we can just keep talking um let me know when you're when you're about to have a big shoot um, and, and then when you revise your sample, get back to me. Um, when I go to events here in New York and people pitch me in person, uh, then it's, it's most usually it's never, it's never the right moment because you're, right. you're either at a reception or, you know, it's always kind of, uh, a little odd, but, but obviously you, I want to uh, hear from them. Do you allow people to do that? Do you allow people to yeah, come in I and pitch it, in you person? Know, you, you kind of, I need, cause maybe to, I'm like, I'm like. I, I, I can't, it's, it's hard for me to write this down, but I'm great in a room or something like that. Uh, do, I don't know if you ever, do you ever engage with people like that? Well, because, yeah, I, I, actually at Union Docs, they do a whole series of um, seminars and events in the summer, um, which are amazing, and I always participate in them. And part of the format, one format is to hear, like, talk to a, a select group of filmmakers, and another one is to, like, one by one watch their, their like, 12 minute samples and on the spot give them my impressions and everybody else is listening so those formats work because it's it behooves me as as a funder to be scouting and tracking and knowing what's out there so that atmosphere and that context is so, it's much needed it keeps us keeps me engaged and keeps the industry alive but you know the con the other context is you know at a re- at a cocktail reception or something, and somebody goes like, starts to pitch me. It's maybe not the right moment. So in, in those cases, I still want to. I'm still curious. So it's more like that sounds great. Email me and let's schedule a call. Right. Or, so if if you meet Jose at yeah. a party, 
don't let's just talk. Don't don't yeah. don't pitch him your yeah. your documentary let's right away. Get to know each other. Set up people. an appointment. Maybe get an email <laughs> going because uh, uh, I can imagine that being an occupational hazard for you. Yeah, but uh, but again, and then on their end, I totally get it because yeah. I get, well, how uh, often do you meet somebody who can do I, that? And I just you know? said be nosy, network. Right, yeah, exactly. So like, I'm contradicting myself. There's but. a sort of an art. No, well, there's an art to it. Like I meet yeah. I meet people. Uh, all the time that I want to pitch, but you know, it's like, hey, listen, I'm not going to talk to you this about uh, my my usual soft pitch is like, listen, I have something I'd like to talk to you about, right? But I'm not going to talk to you about it right now because right. we're in a social setting, blah blah right. blah. Right. But you know, can I get your card? Can we set up a meeting right. later? I could send you some materials. Uh, and having just a good like one sheet, uh, I yeah. found is really good. That you know, a good synopsis of what yeah. it is. Something that's compelling and say, hey, boom, here's my email. Uh, so the lesson here is learn to get good at that, kids. Learn to get yeah. good at pitching on paper so that you can get in the room. Yeah. Um, but anyway, uh, so we're going to wrap up here uh, shortly, but I wanted to kind of just talk to, to you about you a little bit again. Mm -hmm. I know that you've got some some projects on the burno, yeah. burner here. Uh, but so uh, what, have you, what have you got going on that people should keep an eye out for? One recent short film that I made that might be coming back to New York. Uh, I made this experimental short about um, my mom and her relationship to her mother. Um, that actually, and the short will premiere at Bushwick Film Festival in October, and then it screened at the closing night uh, section of the Nighthawk Shorts Festival in November. Um, so I'm very proud of that, and I'm figuring out where it can go after this. Um, I and I, and before then, I did a documentary short called Adolescencia, which is Adolescence in Spanish. Uh, and that one, that, that one actually went um, to over 12 festivals around the world, which I'm very proud of. And that one is about my teenage years growing up in Puerto Rico. Very cool. Um, and, and then I have this collaborative um, called Film Force um, that me and a buddy of mine are... Um, working on which is where it's it's our little film club and it's us selecting a handful of friends or, or peers to make a short um, and we write just a bare bones script only of dialogue consisting only of dialogue and every filmmaker has to kind of um, come up with the story. Oh, that's that. really cool. So. For those who want to uh, learn more about you and learn more about TFI, where can people find you on the web? www.tfiny.org. Uh, that's our website. And then on social media, you can find me at uh, The Jofer on Instagram and Twitter. Fabulous. Well, thanks so much again for coming. Oh, thank and uh, thank you all out there for taking this trip down the rabbit hole. For more episodes of this show, you can find them on our new website, no rest for the weekend podcast.com. You can also subscribe to us on all the major podcast channels, including Anchor, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, Spotify, et cetera, et cetera, wherever you listen to podcasts. Once again, Jose, thank you for coming you. Uh, and joining us. You've been uh, great, and I think people learn a lot from this episode. Uh, for Behind the Rabbit Productions, I'm Jason Godby. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time.